afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It is great to see so many wonderful faces, people we haven't seen in quite a few months. Um, the weather is certainly sparkling outside today. Uh, I won't, I'm wondering if we leapfrog over spring and, and summer's already here. It's really warm. Uh, but anyway, and to our virtual guests, welcome. My name is Tia Teriak. Welcome to What's Up Doc a monthly lecture program sponsored by the Concord Hospital Trust. At this time, we'd like to recognize and thank the Walker Lecture Series for their generous sponsorship of What's Up Doc. The Walker Lecture Series was established here in Concord in 1892 from a bequest in the will of Abigail Walker. Per the terms of her will, the Walker Lecture Series offers lectures on history, literature, art, science, as well as dramatic, musical, and literary performances. All events are free to the public and are held at the Con Concord City Auditorium. We encourage you to check out their website at walkerlecture.org to view their calendar of programs. Again, our thanks to the Walker Lecture Series. We have a wonderful program for you today. And actually, when I was looking back, it was exactly a year ago in June of 2021 that Dr. Nicholas LaRochelle was here as our What's Up Doc speaker, talking to us about time is brain and the connection and treatment for stroke. And we're so happy to have Dr. LaRochelle back. Um, he is the medical director for Concord Hospital's Emergency Department, Transfer Center, and Stroke Program. Dr. La Rochelle joined the staff of Concord Hospital in 2015. He attended the University of Vermont College of Medicine, and he's back today to continue to share the latest information we have regarding strokes. Today, Dr. La Rochelle will talk about secondary stroke prevention for stroke survivors. Please join me in welcoming Dr. La Rochelle. Thank you, Tia. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining today. It's great to be back in person. And welcome, everyone who's uh, watching virtually. Um, so as Tia said, I work in uh, the emergency department. I work in uh, Concord, Laconia, Franklin right now. Um, and I work with uh, transfers in our system and also our, our stroke program. Um, so I'm uh, an emergency medicine physician. I'm certainly not a neurologist or cardiologist, but I can speak to some of the things we do in our stroke program um, uh, here at Concord Hospital. Um, when I talked to you about a year ago, we talked a lot about acute stroke care and what do we do in the first couple of hours when uh, patients present with, a with symptoms that might represent a stroke. Today we're going to talk, review that a little bit, but extend that into the hospital and what do we do inside the hospital and then what do we do as patients leave the hospital? What, are, what can we do to prevent uh, a second stroke? All right. Any questions? And any time during, uh, during this, please interrupt, uh, raise your hand, ask questions, and, and I hope this is interactive for you too. Excellent. All right, so at Concord Hospital, we're a primary stroke center. So we have, a, uh, we have units dedicated to stroke care. We have a, a stroke coordinator. Um, we have kind of stroke guidelines uh, within the hospital. Uh, the, at a comprehensive stroke center, there's more in terms of resources from an endovascular standpoint if we're going to go in and, re and do clot retrieval. Uh, that's kind of the big difference between uh, Concord Hospital and what we see at some of the major academic centers. So when we think about stroke care, uh, this is a care continuum for stroke. So uh, stroke care begins in the community. So it's what we do to educate uh, community members on how to recognize stroke and, and what are the things we need to do to prevent stroke. Emergency medical services, so particularly particular to stroke, early recognition of stroke and contact in EMS is very important. Um, we have uh, systems in place that allow us to prepare for patients uh, who are, may arrive to the hospital with stroke symptoms. So presented by, by uh, emergency medical services uh, is often uh, very important. We'll talk a little bit about care in the emergency department, the inpatient setting, and then what do we do uh, on discharge and as we transition patients back to the community. So these, you'll see a few slides we saw about a year ago. Uh, stroke is the leading cause of disability worldwide. It's a time critical diagnosis. So the, early, the earlier we recognize stroke uh, and 
w the earlier we can administer therapy. We can also help to optimize outcomes by, by uh, initiating things that may, present, uh, may prevent a uh, recurrent stroke. Secondary stroke prevention is, multi is a multidisciplinary process, and we're going to learn that today. Um, and it certainly has significant impact on preventing a, a recurrent stroke. And we went, when we talk about recurrent stroke, we know that patients who experience a stroke or stroke symptoms are at high risk for uh, recurrent symptoms in stroke within the first 24 hours, but also within a couple of weeks. Um, so we'll talk more about that. So there's three uh, kind of steps we'll talk about today. We're going to review a little bit about stroke, acute stroke care. So what can we do in that first four and a half hours um, and up to 24 hours? What do we do to, to determine why uh, someone has had a stroke? And then what can we do to prevent uh, a stroke in the future? So let's talk about uh, acute stroke care first. And this is what we talked about about a, be about a year ago. So our goal in acute stroke care is to mitigate stroke-related disability and mortality. And the way we look at that is we want to, uh, a lot of our studies look at how uh, functional is, a, uh, is someone after having a stroke at about 90 days. Um, a stroke, is, by definition, is an abrupt onset of neurological symptoms and really is a vascular process. So it involves disruption of blood flow within the brain. So either because of blockage of a blood vessel or because of bleeding from a blood vessel into the brain tissue. When we think about classifying strokes, when pa patients present to us really quickly, they may have a progressing or evolving stroke. They may present to us after having completed a stroke, or they may present to us with some symptoms that sound like they may have had a stroke, but their symptoms are getting better. And, our, and that's what we call a TIA. And our new definition for TIA is transient neurologic dysfunction due to focal ischemia, which means there's an area of the brain that didn't get quite as much blood flow for a short period of time without infarction, meaning there's that tissue has been able to recover. So there was either blood flow from around that area or we restored blood flow in time. So say a small clot or a plaque breaks off, there's a brief occlusion, symptoms develop, but we restore blood flow and, and the symptoms go away. Those are, those are important episodes though, because those tell us that someone may be at high risk, depending on their risk factors for stroke, to have a, a recurrent episode in a short period of time. All right, so we're going to talk, most of what we'll talk about today is when we talk about completed strokes and TIAs, and we're going to look at uh, how do we investigate why, that's, why that occurred and how do we prevent it in the future. So, all right, so types of stroke. Um, so you'll see 85% of strokes that we see are ischemic, and that means that there was lack of blood flow to an area of the brain. So that can be because of uh, thrombosis or an embolism. Thrombosis meaning there may be development of a plaque in an artery over time, for example, from blood pressure or, or lipid deposition in, in if, if there's high cholesterol. Or it can be embolic, meaning there's a place in our vascular system that sends a clot up to the brain. So that's 85% of strokes, and that's a lot of what we talk about. And then there's a hemorrhagic stroke, which involves disruption of a blood vessel and blood leaks into brain, the brain parenchyma. All right, the brain. Um, so the brain needs oxygen and glucose, and it's a very heavy user uh, of those. So 15% of our cardiac output, so 15% of the blood that leaves our heart out of the left ventricle to, to bring oxygen to our body goes to the brain, yet 20% of our oxygen consumption uh, by the body uh, is, is, occurs in the brain. Um, so when we disrupt blood flow to the brain, uh, we, have it, what, uh, we have development of uh, free radicals in an inflammatory state that can damage uh, the brain tissue. Neuronal death can actually, so if, you, if we occluded a blood vessel completely and there's no blood flow to an, air, to an area of neurons, within four to 10 minutes you can have neuronal death in that area. More commonly, we're restricting blood flow uh, to that area and this is when we think about acute intervention. We want to know uh, a patient may have symptoms, but still have a little bit of blood flow to that area. And we want to know uh, whether we can intervene to, to uh, provide treatment. So again, an embolism. So this is a blood clot that may have uh, come from the heart, for example, and, and travels to the brain. And then thrombosis. So this is a fatty plaque that develops in an artery, may restrict blood flow slowly over time. 
the plaque could break off, it's, it, it, uh, so it may fracture and break off. Uh, bl uh, blood cells tend to, to, to adhere to it too, that may break off and go to the brain as well. All right, so we talked, so ischemic stroke, most of our strokes, blockage in a blood vessel, and then hemorrhagic stroke, and that's when blood enters the brain, parenchyma, uh, outside of a blood vessel. And it causes a structural disruption to neurons, uh, and a disruption between, of the communication between the neurons in the, in the brain. So uh, this is an uh, example of a CAT scan. So this is the top of the head here, a uh, patient's lying flat, and this is the back of the head. And this, and on CAT scan, which we obtain as soon as patients arrive to the emergency department with um, stroke symptoms, we obtain a CAT scan. And the big thing we're looking for is, is there an area, of, is there any bleeding in the brain? And blood and bone show up white on the CAT scan. So this is an area where the, uh, there's a bleed inside the brain. Chronic <coughs> elevated blood pressure, can lead to that. So if we have chronic elevated blood pressure, it can cause damage to small arteries. And in advanced stages, uh, we can see disruption of the vessel wall and actually a uh, rupture of the wall of the blood vessel. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is, a, is, a, is another type of bleed we see in the brain, uh, often from an often from a, uh, aneurysmal in nature, so uh, a, weak, a weakness in a blood vessel in a certain area in the brain. All right. So one of the challenges with stroke is there, there's a lot of signs and symptoms of stroke and they can be very subtle and they can be very fleeting. So it could be that you're picking up your morning coffee and you notice something doesn't feel right in your hand and it could last about a minute. And then you don't think anything of it, but that, that could be a sign of a, of, of a TIA. And it's important to pay attention to those episodes because they, they actually may be uh, predictors of, uh, of a recurrent stroke in the near future. Um, we often will talk to patients who have had a stroke and what they'll say is, I had this odd episode about a week ago. And they'll describe some type of neurologic symptom that they had that may have been a, f a first indicator that they're at risk to have a stroke. When we think about large stroke syndromes, we can think about, we think about uh, loss of function on one side of the body or the other. Um, and then there's, a, but there's also more subtle strokes too, particularly in the brainstem or the back of the brain where you could have some nausea or vomiting swallowing problems, um, uh, coordination difficulty. So the challenge with stroke, there's a lot of symptoms. Um, so, it's, uh, it's, so it's sometimes difficult to get patients in for acute care just uh, because of the difficulty of identifying those symptoms. This is the blood flow to the brain. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go today. So the heart lives down here. This is the aorta, which is the big blood vessel that comes off the heart. It gives off the uh, carotid artery. It breaks into the internal and external carotid artery. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that happen in these areas that may lead to stroke. At this bifurcation, this is a, a point of high flow. Uh, so often we see some uh, issues here which may lead to plaque formation, changes due to high blood pressure. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is an example of a CAT scan. So um, this, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a, when patients arrive to the emergency department, we obtain a CAT scan. And again, we're looking for bleeding on that initial CAT scan. If we obtain that same CAT, so this patient, uh, in this case, had a large uh, stroke on the left side of their brain. So this involves one of the major blood vessels that leads, the, uh, leads to the brain. And it's in this area of the brain that is, um, impacts our motor, uh, our motor function, our speech. So that these patient, patients experiencing this type of stroke might come in with weakness on one side, inability to talk. Their initial CAT scan might look okay. And that's because their tissue is without blood flow, but there's, there's no bleed in there, and we haven't seen the long-term change to that tissue. If we obtain a CAT scan a couple days later, you can see there's uh, this uh, darker brain parenchyma here, which is representative of an area of stroke. Any questions so far? Yeah. On the, on the slide with the, with the blood flow, yep. where was the circle of Willis? Sure. Let's see. So circle of Willis is right in here. Okay. So. Because my, my brother-in-law had a stroke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, th so there is, so when we think about uh, most of the blood flow to the brain comes from, uh, from the, what we call the anterior circulation. And that's when we see uh, large strokes in the brain. But there's also blood flow from the back of the brain through the vertebral arteries. Um, and 
over and there is a communication though between those uh, two circulations in the circle of Willis. So we'll find sometimes that someone will be having a, a large stroke in the front of the brain or the back of the brain, yet they still have fairly good blood flow in that area, and that's because the collateral blood flow from other areas from the front or the back of the brain. And that actually, the better collateral flow, the better chance we might be able to salvage some of that tissue. All right, so again, just a CAT scan. Uh, this is an ischemic stroke, so lack of blood flow, and you have a, this, a tissue death in the brain um, that shows up dark on CAT scan, and then bright red blood on CAT scan. So this is a, a bleeding stroke here. All right, so almost done talking about the kind of acute phase. Uh, we talked a little bit about TPA last year. Um, in our body, we're constantly forming clots, and we're constantly breaking them down. There's an equilibrium in our body. Um, if you have a, a clotting disorder or, or a bleeding disorder, there's a di disruption in that equilibrium. And certainly those can lead to, for example, blood clots in the legs, stroke, and, and many other things. Um, in the acute period, we do have a, what we call a clot busting medication called TPA um, that can actually help to break down uh, clot if it is in the brain. And there's certain qualifications uh, for that. Um, when we put patients on anticoagulation, our goal is to really to prevent more further clot formation and allow the body to break down clot. This drug actually acts to catalyze the breakdown of the clot. So you can imagine, it's actually, it's a, it's a high-risk drug, um, but we have certain criteria, very particular criteria that, uh, pa that qualify patients for this drug, typically in the first um, four and a half hours. And there's a new drug, Tenecteplase. So last time we talked about the possibility of using tenecteplase in the, f in the future. Um, and this is a genetically engineered variant of that TPA, the last drug we just talked about. Um, and we actually, uh, two months ago, switched to this drug. There's a lot of advantages uh, in terms of how we administer the drug uh, in, in the emergency department. This is the modified Rankin score. So this is what we use in our studies to say, did the therapy we administer, was there a benefit to the patient? And that's when we look at how functional they are uh, at 90 days. So we, we measure when they're in the hospital, and then we measure again at 90 days. So we'll call patients and say, how are you doing? It's been uh, three months since your hospitalization. We want to know uh, how things are going. All right, so time is bringing, we talked about last time. Um, Advancements in neuroimaging and perfusion studies have allowed us to, to better select patients. And then the decision to administer our therapies will be more tailored in, in the future, and we'll look a little bit about that. So um, the target of acute, when we're talking about acute stroke therapy, when patients present with symptoms, there may be a, a small area of tissue that it has died. So there's neuronal death there. But what we, want, what we care about is there's an at-risk area that surrounds it, um, which we want to re uh, restore blood flow to to save that at-risk area. So in that area is called the penumbra. Uh, so that's an area of reversible ischemia. So there's less blood flow there, but the tissue's still surviving for now. And if the longer we, it is with that low flow, um, the more at risk it will be. And you can see here, um, this patient has a small core, so a small area of where tissue death has occurred, but a large area that we can salvage. And that's that collateral flow we mentioned when we're, we talk about circle of Willis and other areas of the brain which may so supply blood flow from a, a, different venue, a different avenue to help uh, supply flow to that area. This, air, this has a large core, so a large area of tissue death, and then a lar smaller area that we can save. All right, so this is um, on the left, a CT scan without contrast and a patient um, presenting acutely with a stroke. And then here, this is an MRI. So if we did a CAT scan, patient has an ischemic stroke, lack of blood flow to that area. Our CAT scan looks normal. If we pop them into an MRI machine, this MRI, this highlights the area where there's less blood, the, where the at risk area where there's less blood flow. Um, and this is important because if we know there's a, a significant at-risk area, we may consider other therapies um, uh, for them at that time. Do you, pardon me, do you automatically, if you have a CAT scan yep. and the person has some questionable symptoms, do you immediately do an MRI as well? So we, uh, MRI is a, it's a little bit more challenging to, to get a quick MRI. So there are some cases where we're able to get them right over to MRI. If a patient has a large stroke in a normal CAT scan, though, 
and, and they're within that window, well, we often will give them the clot busting medication, and then if they ha and then we'll do a, what we call a CT angiogram. And a CT angiogram tells us, is there an occlusion in a large blood vessel? And that tells us, are they a candidate for the second therapy, which is um, a endovascular therapy, where we go in and pull a clot out. Um, what we, what would, in, there's a debate on what to, whether to do the MRI right away to say, is there at-risk tissue, or to send the patient to a center where they might be a candidate for that endovascular therapy. So if we do the MRI here, by the time they get to Boston, that MRI might have changed. So often what happens is if they, we think they might be a candidate, we'll get them in a helicopter, send them to Boston. As soon as they get to the emergency department there, they get an MRI and they know is there at-risk tissue that we might save right before they're doing the procedure. And so they'll know the value of that procedure. So, yeah, so some patients we send to, we, that we send for endovascular therapy might not actually end up getting the therapy just based on what their MRI looks like when they, when they arrive there. But we want to get them as quick as possible there, in, just in case they're a candidate. All right, so talking about, and we're talking just now about large vessel occlusion, those are the patients who are candidates for that endovascular therapy. Um, so that, those are generally, um, when we have a, an occlusion in the large vessel in the anterior circulation, so the, the front circulation in the brain. Those patients have a larger infarct size, so a larger area of tissue that, 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 uh, where you have neuronal death, and they have more severe deficits on presentation. So often, we'll, based on the patient's severity of their um, symptoms, we'll know that they may be a candidate uh, for, uh, 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 for that therapy because they have a, an occlusion in a large vessel. And there's a higher disability and mortality rate associated with that. All right. So if we have an occlusion uh, in the back of the brain, in the basal artery, um, the uh, mortality rate is 90% from that. If we have an occlusion here in, in the internal carotid artery, this is a total occlusion, the mortality rate is 50%, and then 25%. This is a common stroke we see is, a, is an MCA stroke, and that's a large uh, volume of the patients we send to Boston to, to have endovascular therapy. So you can see the mortality rate can be fairly high if, if with these large vessel strokes. Uh, so what they, what they do in Boston is they extend a, uh, what looks like a stent up past the clot. They deploy the stent, grab the clot, and, they, and then they pull it out. And so the, what we do, they shoot some dye up through that blood vessel so we know what does it look like before and then what does it look like after the procedure. This patient had an occlusion. So this is our CT angiogram we were talking about after they get that regular CAT scan. This patient has an occlusion in a blood vessel here. So this is a middle cerebral artery occlusion. This is um, what their angiography looked like prior to uh, the, prior to the uh, endovascular therapy where we pulled the clot out. And then this is after. So we've restored blood flow here. It's pretty impressive. They present here, and then how do you get them to pop? Do they fly? Yep. <laughs> yeah, great question. So what we'll do, um, when a patient presents to RED, uh, say they come in by ambulance. When they get here, we actually bring them into a hallway, and our telestroke neurologist is on a screen already, typically. And so our, yeah, our ER doctor, our telestroke neurologist, talk very briefly with the patient just to know kind of generally what the story is. And what we want to know is when did their symptoms start? Then we rush them to CAT scan, and we do a, a CAT scan without contrast. And that tells, and so that would be this CAT scan. And our question is bleeding or no bleeding? So if, they're ble if there's no blood in the brain, we consider that uh, clot busting medication. And then as soon as we, uh, as we're doing that, we're getting them back into CAT scan to do our angiogram. Because our next question is, is there an occlusion in a big vessel or not? And if there is, then we're making a phone call to Boston and calling a helicopter. And our goal is within two hours usually to get that patient uh, in, the, in the air to the, to the center. And when you get to, we transfer a lot of pa our patients to Beth Israel. When they get to the uh, emergency department there, they go immediately to the MRI machine and then up to the angi angio suite, uh, geography suite with uh, the neuroendovascular team.
So that therapy, we extend to about 24 hours. Of course, the sooner we can get them uh, down there, the better. Um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of the studies when we, uh, that are looking at endovascular therapy are looking at what we call wake-up strokes. So if someone wakes up with symptoms of stroke, we don't really know when the stroke started. So what, pa what of those patients, uh, of that population of patients, are candidates for, for this therapy? So let's move into our stroke investigation. So uh, less than 10% of patients that, come, uh, that present to the emergency department with a stroke are a candidate for either that clot busting medication or, or endovascular therapy. So what do we do for the rest of those patients? We, we keep them in the hospital and we do several things. So we do EKG and cardiac monitoring. So we're screening for arrhythmias and assessing for myocardial injury, so heart dysfunction, which may occur, for example, from a heart attack. We, get our, we complete some pictures, so that our pa most, uh, almost all stroke patients who present to the hospital and even most patients with a TIA will get an MRI while they're inside the hospital. Uh, we do carotid imaging, so that's either with our CAT scan or CTA or angiography we do in the emergency department, or we do an ultrasound and occasionally an MRI that looks at the vessels. We do some blood testing to, to look at uh, risk factors for stroke, so blood sugar, lipids, and then in some patients will do an echocardiography. And that looks at, is there an embolic source from the heart, so a, a clot that forms in the heart, or uh, somewhere else along that pathway that can uh, propagate towards the brain. So we'll talk a little bit more about each of these. Um, about 25% of patients who experience a stroke over age 40 is secondary to atrial fibrillation. So we, we care a lot about um, telemetry monitoring. Uh, so patients who come into the emergency department, if you're uh, experiencing a stroke, we immediately put you on a monitor. And we're looking for that atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. The, it is the most common cardiac arrhythmia. So we see several patients every day in the emergency department with atrial fibrillation. It's a fast, irregular, disorganized rhythm from the top of the heart. It increases stroke risk by three to five times. And that is because they're in when you're in atrial fibrillation, because that is so disorganized, the top of the heart, the rhythm is so disorganized, clots can form in, in, in the heart that can go into the left ventricle and then travel up towards the brain. All right. So um, when we think about atrial uh, fibrillation flutter, um, we want to prevent a recurrent stroke. And one of the things we consider for these patients is anticoagulation. So you've probably heard of our, our older blood thinners, Coumadin. There's a new generation uh, of direct oral anticoagulants that we use uh, very frequently with atrial fibrillation if patients are, are qualified for that. Eliquis is, is an example of that. Um, we start with atrial fibrillation or flutter. We typically start anticoagulation if someone has a confirmed stroke about 24 to 48 hours after admission. Um, and one of the reasons we wait and don't do that right away is because we worry if someone experiences a stroke, we've taken blood flow away from that area of the brain, and, it, and then we, as we reperfuse that area of the brain, that the vessels are fragile. So the patient in that area is actually, surprisingly, at risk for, a, for bleeding into that area of the brain. So we want to give their brain a little bit of time to recover and balance that with starting anticoagulation to prevent uh, clot propagation up towards the brain. For patients who are in atrial fibrillation but experience a very large stroke, or they do actually bleed into the area where they had an ischemic stroke, we sometimes wait uh, several weeks. And that goes the same for uncontrolled uh, hypertension. So we also don't want to put them on a blood thinner when um, that tissue is fragile in the brain and there's a high pressure in that area, so they may be at risk for bleeding there. We do, in, for patients who present to the emergency department, um, we, in atrial fibrillation, whether they're go home or admitted to the hospital, we do actually risk stratify them to determine, do we need to place them on a blood thinner right away? So we know that their th increased risk for stroke is three to five times. And we use a tool called the CHADS-VASC uh, uh, score that, that tells us some of the risk factors uh, for, for stroke. And we use that tool to tell us are they high risk enough that they should be put on a blood thinner for stroke prevention? And that's a big decision. Being on a blood thinner puts you at risk for, for bleeding. So if you fall and hit your head, or you could have a or GI bleed. But we use this score to tell us how, how likely is it that someone is going to have a stroke from their atrial fibrillation. 
And sometimes we actually initiate the blood thinner if we think they might uh, be a candidate for um, electrical cardioversion. So if they're gonna see a cardiologist in a couple weeks and if they're still in atrial fibrillation, we might uh, shock their heart out of that in our, in our cardiology lab where they're doing an ultrasound at the same time. How likely is it are we able, that we're able to catch atrial fibrillation or flutter in the emergency department or while they're having a short stay in the hospital? It's actually not that likely. So there's, and when we, something we always consider is when patients present with a stroke and we don't know why, um, is that they have what we call intermittent or proximal atrial fibrillation, meaning they're intermittently in atrial fibrillation, but we might not see it on the monitor. So sometimes we do use tools such as what we call the Zio patch, where we put a monitor on them for a couple of weeks to monitor for atrial fibrillation. And it tells us their, what we call their disease burden to how, if they're in atrial fibrillation, how much of that time over the two weeks do they live in atrial fibrillation. And that's often for patients when we can't, we don't, they don't have a, if they don't have a lot of risk factors for stroke, we're not really sure why, um, we put a monitor on to say maybe it is atrial fibrillation. So classifying atrial fibrillation, we uh, just mentioned proxismal atrial fibrillation. These patients typically return to a normal rhythm without any medical assistance. Persistent is considered greater than seven days and, and permanent. So there are patients that live in atrial fibrillation and our focus in those patients is anticoagulation and then really controlling their rate. So we don't want them to have an elevated heart rate where the heart gets tired and they can go into heart failure, but we're able to kind of block the, one of the nodes in the heart to, to keep their rate balanced. Um, but they do live in that rhythm all the time. This is Dr. Chodosh. He's one of our electrophysiologists. Um, and for several years now, he's been performing a procedure here called uh, the Watchman device. And this is, an implanted, this is a device that's implanted in the left atrial appendage. So our concern in atrial fibrillation, if the left atria is beaten erratically, that the blood's not moving uh, uh, like it typically would through the left atria. And what that can lead to is you can lead to blood that actually pools in the, in the um, left atrial appendage and it can form a clot in that area. So the Watchman device actually blocks that area. And our, our <coughs> studies show that when we do that, it, it reduces stroke risk signif uh, significantly enough that we can actually take patients off anticoagulation. So that's part of our uh, stroke care and our kind of multidisciplinary care for stroke <coughs> prevention that we work with our cardiologists with. You can see another picture here of that device. And that, sorry, that device is left in place? Yep. Yeah, left in place. Yeah, yeah so we're, we actually have a lot of patients who've undergone this procedure now. And it's a, a significant lifestyle benefit. So we are actually able to get patients off anticoagulation. So we, when we think about the risk for GI bleed, the risk of falls, head injuries, um, it's, 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 it's significant. So. All right, echocardiography. Um, so this is a, an ultrasound of the heart. This is the uh, right ventricle, so a, th a thinner wall. Left ventricle, the workhorse of our heart. And these are the atria, so the right atria, the left atria. And things we're looking for on ultrasound, so say someone has uh, had a heart attack and their left ventricle doesn't pump quite as well. Similar to an atrial fibrillation when the atria is not, is, uh, there's blood pool in, in areas of the atria, you can actually form a clot in the left ventricle. So we often put patients on anticoagulation if their left ventricle is, is, is working very poorly, we'll place them on a blood thinner because we worry that flow is, is stagnant and uh, they could form a clot. So part, when we're looking in, in a stroke patients, when we're looking for what we call a cardioembolic stroke, so a clot that may go to the brain, we look in the heart, we look at the left ventricle to determine uh, if there's a clot there. And we actually look in the, in the, we look for atrial thrombus as well to, in, in the setting of atrial fibrillation. Now, if we think someone had a stroke from atrial fibrillation uh, and we're looking on ultrasound in the heart and we don't see a, a clot in the left atrium, doesn't, it, it's a, not a great study to identify that. So we would still place a patient on anticoagulation, even if they had a normal ultrasound, just because we know the risk is so high. And they're probably, and they're very likely maybe a clot in there. When we find um, an LV thrombus or clot in the, in the left ventricle or an atrial thrombus, the, it, the stroke related to that is often has a higher mortality. So these are clots that often end up in a larger blood vessel 
and you get a larger area of brain that's impacted. Uh, cerebral imaging we talked about um, a couple of minutes ago, so that's our CAT scan and MRI. We do while patients are in the hospital. So our MRI helps us in a couple ways. It, it helps us to say were the symptoms related to a stroke or not. Now, if someone had a, has a normal MRI, they may have had a TIA, which we'll talk about in a minute, and, and we may treat it just the same as a stroke because we're worried about preventing that next stroke. And then we often will, if we have not done a CT angiogram, so if say someone has, um, does not have very good kidney function and we don't want to give them contrast, uh, sometimes we'll do an ultrasound of their neck to look at the carotid arteries in the neck to see if there's a blockage in those arteries. That could be from a clot, that could be from a plaque, and really what we're looking more is kind of for kind of chronic stenosis where we get plaque formation uh, in that carotid artery. And this is the carotid bifurcation. This is a common area where uh, blood flow splits going, uh, towards, uh, going towards the brain, and there's a lot of turbulence in this area. There can be trauma to the wall of the blood vessel, particularly uh, with hypertension, and that's a common area for clot formation. So this is an example of an ultrasound here where we can see there's good blood flow below here, and then we have a plaque that has formed here with restricted blood flow. We do still have some blood flow beyond that, but you can imagine that at times there's a limited flow to the brain. And in patients, and sometimes if in patients may have kind of waxing and waning symptoms, and so if their blood pressure drops a little bit, say if they're dehydrated, they might develop stroke symptoms if they have a flow limitation uh, going towards the brain. So we have a, a vascular surgery program so at our, with our Cardiovascular Institute that um, performs a procedure called the uh, carotid endarterectomy or stentin. Over time, as we were talked about, you can build up some plaque in the carotid arteries um, that restricts blood flow to the brain. The plaque can also rupture and travel to the bra brain, or we have a, a clot that forms on that plaque that can propagate to the brain too. So this is a surgical procedure um, where, we make an where the vascular surgeon goes in, makes an incision in the neck. They bypass the carotid artery from below the area of the plaque to above the area of the plaque, and then they actually go in, open the blood vessel, and physically remove that plaque. And then stentin is, is there's other indications for stentin for patients who are, are poor surgical candidates, or if they had a really big plaque and we were able to get most of it out, but they're still having symptoms, we, uh, this, they might be a candidate for a stent. So we have, I think, uh, four or five vascular surgeons here that we are performing these procedures every week. The benefit um, typically in this procedure is within a couple of weeks from, from stroke. So we, that's the reason we, perf we look at the carotid uh, vessels while they're here in the hospital with us to, so that we identify anyone who's a potential candidate for that procedure. So blood testing. Uh, so this is really uh, uh, geared towards risk factor modification. So while patients are here, we'll uh, send their lipids so we, and we may place them on medication, often a high dose statin while they're here even for TIA sometimes, for high-risk TIA. And then we look at their hemoglobin A1C, which is an a average of their blood sugars over several months. All right, so let's chat about secondary stroke prevention, which overlaps a little bit about with what we do in the hospital. So this is our last section here. So the, the, we know there's a risk for recurrent stroke after TIA. So if you have a resolution of your symptoms, um, a normal MRI, but you're high risk, um, and we know that aggressive management of risk factors can prevent that re recurrent stroke. So this often involves an uh, interdisciplinary team, so we often chat with our neurologists, cardiologists if there's something they can help us modify, uh, and then a transition of care uh, to, uh, to the outpatient uh, side. So we have nurse navigators that work in the hospital, and so everyone, patients when they're discharged, the nurse navigator is connecting them to any additional testing or resources they need as they, as they transition back to their primary care physician. Some estimates, uh, there are 80 to 90 per percent of strokes that are preventable when we think about all the risk factor modification uh, that we can do. There are fixed risk factors, so age, patients who have had a prior stroke are at risk for a recurrent stroke. There's certainly a very strong genetic component. And then there are modifiable risk factors. We think about exercise, alcohol, tobacco, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, high cholesterol, blood pressure. Um, so, so these are things that we, in the outpatient side, this is why we care so much about blood pressure control long term, uh, diabetes, and, and other habits.
All right, so which one of which one of these do you think is the most powerful that we can modify? Which or which one of these do you think is most is most um, impactful? Cholesterol. Cholesterol. So it's actually blood pressure. Yeah. yeah. Blood pressure plays a, a huge is the leading risk factor for stroke. And what we really worry about is long-term blood pressure. So we see a lot of patients in the emergency department who, who are worried about their blood pressure. So they come in with an elevated blood pressure. And one of the questions we ask, we want to know is have they been elevated for a long time? So we often will not place patients on medications acutely in the emergency department if, they, if patients don't have symptoms from the high blood pressure. And the reason being is we want to know where they live at long, over several days to weeks, where their blood pressure lives before we initiate the therapy. In that long-term uh, analysis, really what we care about is the chronic changes to the blood vessels that occur with high blood pressure long-term. Um, so even a modest blood pressure reduction over the course of a, a long period can have a significant reduction in stroke risk. When blood pressure is elevated, that leads to collagen and fibronectin deposition. So basically we're increasing the, the stiffness of the blood vessel, which may limit flow and there's necrosis that occurs in the blood vessel as a result of that as well. And this is really, it's really an inflammatory phase. So we cause trauma to the blood vessel. We get a bunch of inflammatory cells that go to the area. The, the wall of that blood vessel that has some muscle in it, it remodels. And so those are the changes we see over time. So you can have, blood pressure can lead to uh, changes in larger, uh, sorry, elevated blood pressure can lead to changes in larger vessels that can cause a, an occlusion in the carotid artery. So this is that bifurcation of the carotid where we've had some, some change to the wall of the blood vessel over time. It can also cause small bleeds inside the brain. So it can cause what we uh, often uh, term lacunar infarcts. So these are uh, abnormalities of small blood vessels deep in the brain, and that occurs over time with changes to the, to the wall of the small vessel. This is um, an example of, yes, so this is a patient who um, has an MRI of their brain, and you can see there's diffuse, what we call white matter changes. So this patient has had elevated blood pressure for a very long time, and we see changes secondary to their elevated blood pressure in the brain where we've had damage to, to deep areas of the brain and, uh, because of damage to those small, small vessels. So when we consider, um, blood pressure medication. We often uh, will start patients on blood pressure medication in the hospital if that's a significant risk factor. We look at their comorbidities. So what other diseases do they have that increase their risk for stroke? What is their long-term tolerability? We do look at affordability of medication too. Surprisingly, so say uh, someone has um, an ischemic stroke, so they had um, an occlusion of, of one of their blood vessels, they're in the hospital, we actually let their blood pressure, we do, do what we call uh, permissive hypertension. And especially if, the, if it's an occlusion in a larger vessel, we do this for about 48 to 72 hours um, after, after uh, they present to the hospital. And the reason being is, if we have an occlusion in, in a blood vessel and our brain, in the, there's a clot and it starts to break up or we're starting to get past that plaque that was there, um, we wanna have enough pressure to reperfuse that area of the brain so we save that tissue. Our long term, we want to reduce the blood vessel, so we reduce uh, blood pressure, so we reduce the trauma to the wall of the bl blood vessel. But we'll let patients uh, their blood pressure rise to, to up to 220 uh, systolic while they're in the hospital for the first 24 to 72 hours, <clears throat> uh, 48 to 72 hours, um, and then we start to bring their blood pressure down. If, they've if we've given a clot busting medication, however, we do have a cap on their blood pressure, so we limit their blood pressure because we know that the combination of elevated blood pressure and a blood thinner in that tissue puts them at higher risk for, for bleeding. When you're talking <coughs> about elevated blood pressure, yep. what are you talking about? Mainly the systolic, I assume. Yep. So uh, for most patients, 140 over 90. And then for patients with other risk factors for stroke, we actually want them below 130 over 80. Well, I know, re mm -hmm. know recently they've been talking about, the, the normal used to be 140 over what, 80 or something. Mm -hmm. Now they're talking about 120. It's yeah, and there's some talk about 100 and, 120, 120 as well. Yeah, in, in, in some high risk patients. Yeah. Over yeah. 80. Is it true that you, there's not much one can do about uh, elevated uh, diastolic blood pressure? 
there are some medications that may impact that a little bit more than others, yeah. but um, I, there's usually less impact than we see on the systolic. Yep. More on the systolic. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So most patients uh, who have had an ischemic stroke, if, they, if there's no evidence of bleeding, we will start them on an antiplatelet medication. And the, and, the, and the main one being aspirin. So aspirin blocks the formation of thromboxane A2, so it inhibits platelet aggregation inside the blood vessel and may reduce clot formation. All right. Something, there's a population of patients who have had a, a minor stroke or if they've had a, uh, or they have a, had a high risk TIA, meaning they had a, some symptoms that went away, their images look okay, but were concerned enough that they, that they were representative of, a, br of that, a brief neurologic dysfunction from lack of blood flow, and they have a lot of risk factors. We will place them on what we call dual antiplatelet therapy. So that involves aspirin uh, and Plavix. And there is evidence that a 10 to 21 day course of aspirin plus Plavix may reduce stroke recurrence and improve quality of life. We, generally, we, st we start that while the patient's in the hospital. We stop at 21 days. The reason being is after that, after that acute period, we actually believe that the patient is at increased risk for bleeding, so the, benefit, so the, the risks outweigh the benefit at that time. We do are able to predict based on risk factors. So this is the ABCD2 score. Uh, we can predict uh, risk of stroke recurrence. So age is a predictor, age over 60. Blood pressure elevation, we're talking about. Um, clinical features, so unilateral weakness, meaning potential for a large stroke, speech disturbance, duration of symptoms, and diabetes. And when we give someone a score, we can plug that in to our ABCD2 score and we can put them into a category of low, moderate, or high risk, and then we know about what their risk of a recurrent stroke is uh, up to 90 days. So if you're in that high risk category, your risk of recurrent stroke could be up to 18% within 90 days. That does help us to say what, what therapy should we tailor to that patient. All right, this is uh, talking a little bit, this uh, slide shows um, when we look at uh, the studies that, that were completed, with aspirin alone for the, in that first period of time after a stroke versus uh, um, aspirin plus uh, Plavix. And it, we, the studies did show that there's a reduction uh, in uh, recurrent stroke when we use dual antiplatelet therapy. There is a slight increase in bleeding events, but overall that we, it's felt that the advantage in reduction in long-term uh, mort morbidity from uh, using those two platelet agents outweighs that risk of bleeding. The risk from bleeding, you, there, aspirin it has a small risk to bleeding. Plavix does increase that risk for sure. And then um, when we put someone on an on a actual blood thinner, which would be like Coumadin or, or Eliquis, that, that risk is even higher. And we often, do, we often do things to look for bleeding, uh, such as an endoscopy or a colonoscopy to figure out where the blood um, may be going. But it's, it's sometimes it's tough to, to determine. Yeah, yeah, she had a few of those done and couldn't. <coughs> yeah. Places where she was weeping, is what they called it. Yep. And fixed that, but they said that wasn't the reason. Yeah, and there's a, and then we got kind of we have to go searching elsewhere. Often we involve our hematology team then uh, to figure out what, where's uh, what is the source of that. All right, and then we were talking about Plavix. Um, so we we're talking about our 21-day therapy of aspirin plus Plavix, um, and that uh, our chronic use leads to increase risk of bleeding without benefit. So at, at 21 days, we pull patients off. Typically, if they're at really high risk, there are some cases we extend it to 90 days, but most patients 21 days. All right, so we'll talk. Let's talk about anti anticoagulation. So that's really for patients we're talking about atrial fibrillation. So if they have a source uh, of uh, a clot, often from the heart. So valvular, um, patients who have valvular heart disease, who have had a, a um, heart valve replacement will often be on anticoagulation. For non-valvular atrial fibrillation, if they have a clot in the heart, um, patients with a significantly <coughs> reduced function in their left ventricle at risk for clot formation. Um, but atrial fibrillation is the most common uh, indication. We talked about that scoring system we use in patients with atrial fibrillation to determine do we place them on a, on a blood thinner. And then cholesterol lowering therapy. Um, so this is more, we do place patients on a high dose statin uh, often when they leave the hospital, but this is more, uh, the greatest benefit is long term. Uh, so cholesterol lower therapy, so lowering cholesterol level may reduce endothelial dysfunction, 
uh, thrombogenesis and really the stress on the wall of that blood vessel. So this is really an inflammatory process. It stresses the wall of the blood vessel and causes the blood vessel to remodel. And there's a long-term benefit for absolute uh, stroke risk reduction. So patients often go home on a statin and we maintain that long-term if they're at risk for future stroke. So uh, cholesterol, uh, cholesterol, elevated cholesterol does increase risk for progress, uh, progression of atherosclerosis, so that blood vessel change on the wall of the blood vessel. Um, Zedia is another medication we use in patients who are intolerant to, uh, um, to statins or if they have an inadequate response to statins. Blood, uh, blood glucose control, so this elevated blood glucose is an independent risk factor for stroke. 20% uh, of um, patients uh, with uh, uh, advanced diabetes, uh, stroke will be the cause of their death. And we're really looking at two, again, like cholesterol, what is our long-term glucose control? And in the hospital, we're checking that hemoglobin A1C. So patients may present with an elevated blood uh, glucose because of the release of stress hormones when they see us and they're having a stroke. What we want to know is what is their average glucose over three months and how do we tailor therapy for that? And again, reduce the changes to the blood vessel long term. Elevated blood glucose long term leads to, again, oxidative stress. And the big thing is inflammation. It is prothrombogenic. Uh, so we want to decrease those changes, particularly in the small blood vessel, in, those, in the walls of the small blood vessels. Additional factors, smoke and cessation. So a lot of your same cardiovascular risk factors that we talk about are risk factors for stroke. So smoking, uh, tobacco use, um, we encourage physical activity, diet, alcohol, and, and, and uh, uh, substance use reduction. So this is just to say that um, in the future, I think there's going to be a lot of technology, too, that will help us. So if you think about the Apple Watch, there's a program now on the Apple Watch that uh, can actually take an EKG and monitor for atrial fibrillation. So we actually do see patients that will we'll pull up their phone and say, I had this, I had this uh, fast heart rate for about 10 minutes, and here it is on my phone. Or they may have an app that shows us that maybe they were in atrial fibrillation. So I think there's a lot that will happen from a technology standpoint that will help us in, for example, atrial fibrillation and stroke. All right. So just a reminder of our warning signs. This is the scale we use that we educate the public on. It's called the BFAST scale. Um, so uh, these are uh, symptoms that may represent stroke, sudden onset of uh, loss of balance, change in vision or, or trouble with vision. Uh, if someone's face ha uh, has a facial droop, if they have arm or leg weakness, trouble sweet speaking, or they seem confused, it's time to call 911. And that's what the education we provide to the public. Any questions? Yes? I'm afraid to ask this question, but I will anyway. Sure. <laughs> I wanted you to talk about the technology that's available. You talked about the Apple Watch. Mm -hmm. What about the TV ad, that's the little pad that you put your fingers on that tells you everything you need to know about your, your heart in 30 seconds or less, and it's only $79? That I, that I don't know about yet, but I'm going to look that up. <laughs> it's on TV for everybody to see. I'm just curious as to A, the effectiveness of, effectiveness of it and its value as it relates to diagnosing some of the things you just discussed. That's a good question. I, I, I don't know about that, but... You've never seen that ad no. on TV? No. <laughs> $80 seems cheap for, the, to, for that knowledge. Have you ever seen the ad on TV? <laughs> Everybody's seen it yeah. on TV. <laughs> put, your, put your fingers on the pad, and in 30 seconds on your computer or on your telephone, you get the results to determine whether any of these three measurements, whether you need to be worried about them. I'll have to look this up. <laughs> I've been watching too much Paw Patrol, I think. You haven't like seen it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching different channels than I watch. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what are some things that we can do now to um, help prevent stroke? Yeah. So um, uh, primary care visits, so yearly visits to kind of monitor. Uh, the big thing is, is long-term blood pressure control, diabetes, uh, identification of diabetes. So exercise is a big thing, tobacco cessation. Um, Blood pressure monitoring too. So a lot of time we'll recommend to our patients to get uh, a, uh, just a blood pressure cuff for home. And so you can, at home, you can 
if your concern blood pressure may be high, you can check your blood pressure daily. We don't want you to check it over and over again if, it, if, it, if, you, if it's high. If you check it again in 10 minutes, it's going to be high again because you're anxious about that. But if you get up in the morning, check your blood pressure, write it down. And often that's a good thing to bring to your primary care doctor's office because what they want to know, and even what, what we like in the emergency department is if you're having elevated blood pressures, we want to know where do you live every day. So are you, is it elevated because uh, you're at the doctor's office and, and you may be anxious there? Or is it elevated because something else is going on from a health standpoint? Uh, so blood pressure is a, a big thing. Um, and then moving every day. Uh, so walking, uh, eat, um, diet, exercise, plenty of vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What type of stroke did Teddy Bruschi have? Teddy Bruschi, I don't remember. Um, I believe he had a, I believe he had a posterior circulation stroke. I don't recall, but yes. Yeah. Dr. Lamarcheau, yeah. your your example about picking up a cup of coffee and then mm -hmm. not feeling exactly 100. Mm -hmm. What would your recommendation be then if you experience something like that? Yeah. Contact your primary care person and. Check in. Yeah, so that. You don't want all of us showing up in your. Yeah, so that, that's a, and As I said that, I was, I was thinking about that too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's. I think it's important to monitor for those things. So, those are sometimes things we. So, if we have some discoordination, and we often hear people will say, I had trouble, you know, my vision went blank, or I had trouble uh, picking up the cup of coffee, my hand wouldn't work. Those are things we, we want you to contact your primary care physician about just so we, we start to, I, to track that to see if there are development of neurologic symptoms. And if the symptoms are really significant, so if all of a sudden you can't use an arm for 10 minutes, that's a, that's, that's a really concerning symptom, we want you to come see us immediately. Okay. And, the, and the reason being is we wanna identify, did, did you have a TIA? Could this represent a, a stroke? And sometimes when, when that occurs, the brain may have recovered fairly well, but there may actually, we, on an MRI, we may see a small stroke. Uh, so yet your your function has returned. So the larger the symptom, we definitely want you to come see us. But we also want you to, to seek to talk to at least your primary care provider if you see if you have subtle symptoms like that. And that's the, one of the challenges with stroke is there's so many different symptoms. It's hard to to know uh, which symptoms may be attributed to stroke right. or not. Yeah. yeah. With increased visual migraines be an indication of TIA. Um, so headache is not no, it, visual. 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 Uh, not necessarily. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, but vi but certainly when we when we <coughs> diagnose patients with a, with a visual migraine, often we've done a workup to look at risk factor for stroke and to, and to look for stroke uh, before we arrive at that arrive at that diagnosis too. So so we have some information ahead of time. Yeah. Um, I, I had the Johnson and Johnson vaccine mm -hmm. um, for COVID. Of course, in a day or two later, all the the panic started with the blood clots, etc. Mm -hmm. And I remember calling my general practitioner's office in a panic, and I basically was told, "Well, if you really start having a severe headache, get to the ER." Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "I mean, could could that have led to stroke? I mean, again, I'm, I don't know enough about." Yeah. It, and, and how bad does a headache have to be to be like, you know? Yeah. yeah. So uh, when we look at uh, clotin related to Johnson and Johnson, it still was very statistic statistically very small. Right. Yeah. Um, so thinking about the headache, um, the the bad headaches we worry about are when the headaches are really sudden in onset and maximal in onset. So that really, severe. really severe. Yeah. And then we also ask more questions when headaches are new. So if someone has not, is not a person who typically gets headaches, and so if, if we see uh, someone for a headache in the emergency department, our, one of our questions is maximal at onset, but is, are headaches typical for you? So is there something that, or is there something that could have triggered this? And, and, and then are there other neurologic symptoms? Those are, those, are the, those are the big things. Or if you're someone who typically gets headaches, is this one different, and what are the different features about it that might tell us we need to look further? So, yeah. Good question. Question. Yes. With the announcement that we heard, mm -hmm. you have stroke activation teams. Are they different 
inpatient versus in the ED? Yeah, great question. So we have a, a stroke, we have a team in the emergency department. It's part of our kind of normal care that we provide. Uh, so that involves uh, a tech, a, a ER tech, nursing, uh, a, pro, a provider, our telestroke team, our lab, it, of a lot of different folks. Uh, the same thing we kind of mimic on the inpatient side. So we have an ICU nurse that responds to the stroke. Our, if our stroke uh, program manager is here, she'll respond to the stroke as well. Um, and then we have a provider team that responds as well. And we actually use the same process that we do in the emergency department where we have a cart or in our, tele, or in our telestroke neurologist comes to the bedside to evaluate the patient. Um, Yeah. Good to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the night yeah. that my wife had to be med flighted, I couldn't count how many people were in that room trying yeah. to save her. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. We, we, stroke we take very seriously, just we, we uh, as you know, there's a lot of disability from stroke and we want to know whether we can offer acute therapy uh, in the ED. And we have a good partnership with our telestroke service that we work together with them and they're on screen with us right away. So, thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Lovershaw? Uh, I just want to remind everybody that we upload all of our What's Up Doc uh, programs up to the Concord Hospital YouTube channel. So if you'd like to go back and take a look at Dr. La Rochelle's uh, program from last June, which is his kind of part one to his stroke series here, it's called Time is Brain, and uh, you can find it and take a look at that, along with any of the others through the winter that you might not have been able to come out and, and join us for uh, at all that. Dr. La Rochelle, thank you. Thank we you. We know you are super busy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you for supporting Let's Up Doc and for giving us your time today. Another fantastic presentation on a subject I, I think almost all of us know somebody who has had a stroke or, or something like that. Um, thank you again for being here. Um, I'd love to see you next month. In June, we have Dr. Chandler Marietta from Concord Otolaryngology. <laughs> I'm sure I butchered that. Um, ear, nose, and throat specialty and he'll be here to uh, talk about all that we need to know about keeping our ears, noses and throats healthy. So thanks again, enjoy the great weather, have a wonderful weekend, stay safe, stay healthy.